Hello class, in this lesson we're going to learn about Cavalier's principle and how to apply the different formulas for volume. So first, I'd like you to take a look at these three regions, and what do you notice they have in common? What's special about them? Well, hopefully you said something about their widths, and in this case the width is called a cross-sectional length. And for these three regions, no matter which cross-sectional length we look at, because it's all the same distance from the bottom here, they're all equal. So no matter what height we're looking at, those cross-sectional lengths are the same. And when that's the case, when they have the same height and all those cross-sectional lengths are equal, then they have the same area. This is called the principle of parallel slices in the plane. And if you think about approximating each area with rectangles, it makes a lot of sense because we can just shift around where the rectangles are, and it's not going to change the area at all. The rectangles haven't fundamentally changed their areas, they're just changing their positions. So think of it as just shifting around those tiny rectangular regions and getting a new shape with the same area. Now we can extend this concept into three dimensions, and this is what we call Cavalier's principle. So if we had a stack of papers and we twisted it, you know, moved it around, you know you still have the exact same amount of sheets in it, so the volume hasn't changed, but it has a different shape. And that's a really informal version of what we have here for Cavalier's principle. So here's the formal math definition. And if you think about it in terms of coins, it makes a lot of sense. Right? We can stack up coins as a right circular cylinder, and we get this stack. And if we just push the middle a little bit, we still have the same amount of coins, so the volume hasn't changed, but the shape is different. So these two stacks have the exact same volume. So how is this principle related to the principle of parallel slices? Well, with the slices, we were saying that if the lengths were the same, then the area of the regions were the same. And in this case, we're talking about cross-sections, regions, and if those are all the same, then the total volume is the same. So we're just extending it to a third dimension. Now we can use this principle to figure out the volume for oblique pyramids. So in this case, each of the cross-sections have the same area, and we want to show that the volumes are the same. Well, if we approximate each of the volumes by using prisms, we know that each of these individual prisms has the same volume because the areas are the same. They have the same height. So we can move them around and smush them however we want without changing their volumes. So what can we say about the relative volumes of the two solids? That they're going to be exactly the same because all of those cross sections have the same area. And this is very similar to what we did with the regions. And the more and more prisms we make, what happens to our approximation of the true volume? it gets better and better, so it gets refined. So the more prisms we use, the closer to the actual volume we get. So this lets us calculate the volume for oblique cylinders. Right Now we can use the formula base times height because we know if we compare a right prism with an oblique prism where the bases are exactly the same, it doesn't matter how we move it around, by Cavalier's principle, they're going to have the same volume. All right, what's the formula that we learned for the volume of a cone or a pyramid? We already learned it in a previous lesson. That's one-third the area of the base times the height. But now the question is, why does this formula work? Well, there's not an easy way that we can fit three congruent pyramids or cones to form a cube. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to start with a unit cube. So all the lengths are one. And we're going to turn it into a few different pyramids. We're going to put a point exactly in the middle and connect that vertex to all of the vertices of the cube. So how many pyramids will we have if we do this process? How many pyramids do we get? Well, hopefully you said six, and it makes sense because there's six spaces on a cube. And if you're having trouble visualizing that, let's look at GeoGebra real quick. So here's our cube. And if I play this animation over here, you can see how we have six pyramids that fit together nicely when we uh, put all their vertices in the center. So that shows that we get six different pyramids. So since there's six congruent pyramids, we know that the volume of each one is one-sixth of a cubic unit. Now, we want to figure out what the volume is of a pyramid that has the same base and the same height as this cube. Unfortunately, the height is only half of that. So how can we correct that? What could we do to figure out the volume of the pyramid with the correct height that we want? 
well, we just multiply the height of the current one by a factor of two. Right? This isn't going to be a similarity transformation because we're only scaling in one direction. That's okay. We learned in the previous lesson that we would just multiply the previous volume by two, right? Because we're not scaling in the other directions. So this gives us that the pyramid with the same height as the cube is going to have one third of its volume. And if we apply what we learned with scaling in different directions and talk about rectangular pyramids, we would scale in one direction by A and the other by B, so for the base. And we still have the, the height that we just calculated. So one third the area of the base times the height. And we can extend this to general cones. What would we do in order to figure out the volume of this general cone? Well, we want to compare it to a right rectangular pyramid that has the same base area. Right, because this is a kind of nasty figure to try to figure out what the uh, the region is inside of it. But we know how to figure out the area inside of a right rectangle of a of a rectangle. Now figure out that region. So we learned the cone cross section theorem that says that if the bases have the same area and the pyramids have the or the general cones have the same height, then any cross section is going to have the same area. So how does this help us with Cavalier's principle? Well, we know when all the cross sections have the same area and the heights are the same, that the volumes will be the same. So we know that these two general cones have the exact same volume. And so the formula for the cone is also one third the area of the base times the height. So now it's some time to practice our formulas. So try exercise one, and then I'll show you my solution. So we have our formula for the cylinder. It's going to be pi r squared times the height, so 300 pi. And the volume of the cone is going to be one third of that, so 100 pi. Now it wants to know the volume that's in the cylinder but outside the cone, so we subtract them and we get 200 pi. Remember, when it says an exact answer, that means don't give a decimal approximation. So we're going to leave our answer in terms of pi. Okay, try exercise two, and then I'll show you my solution. So in this case, we know the volume. And we got to figure out what the area of the base is and then the length of the side. So we uh, plug into the formula. You can call the area of the base x, capital B, whatever you want to call it. When we solve, we get the area of the base is 49. Now we know that it's a square because it says a square pyramid. So we take the square root of that. And the length of the side will be 7 inches. Try to find the volume of this cone, and then I'll show you my solution. So in this case, they don't directly give us the radius, but that's okay because we have a right triangle here. So the square root of 137 is hypotenuse. And so to figure out the radius, we use this formula. So apply a Pythagorean theorem, and we solve this, and the square root of 16 is 4. So we plug 4 into our formula for volume, and we get 176 over 3 pi. Here's a density problem. They give us the true density of gold, and we want to figure out if the pyramid we have is solid gold. So try to solve this on your own, and then I'll show you my solution. So we got we know the mass already. We got to find the volume. So the volume is one third the area of the base times the height, and so it has a volume of fifty cubic centimeters. So we divide the mass and the volume, and we get eighteen point eight four. So the density is not 19.32 grams per cubic centimeter, so it's not solid gold. It could either uh, be a little bit hollow, or it could be a mixture of different metals, but we know it's 100% not entirely solid gold. So now we want to talk about spheres. So I'd like you to think about the difference between a marble and a beach ball, and which one do you think you would call the sphere? Well, maybe you think it's both, because they both have the same general 3D shape, but a sphere is pretty similar to a circle. It's just referring to the outside part of that shape. So a sphere is hollow. And the marble is like a, in mathematics, we call it a ball or a solid sphere. And that's more like a disk. So that's when we also include everything that's inside of the shape. So there's a difference. This, the sphere is just the outside. The solid sphere is the, the entire thing with the inside included. So we want to figure out what the volume of a, of a sphere is. So what's that? Uh, space inside it equal to. And to do that, 
we're going to look at a hemisphere, a cone, and a cylinder, and they're all going to have the same height and the same large radius R, that capital R. And what we're going to do is we want to figure out what the area of the cross sections equals when the heights uh, when the heights are equal. And by doing some uh, geometry and algebra work with Pythagorean theorem and similar triangles, we get these formulas. So the area of the cross sections of the hemisphere is pi times r squared minus pi times the height squared. For the cone, it's pi times the height squared. And for the cylinder, it's pi times the radius squared. So what's the relationship between these three quantities? Well, the third one is what we get if we add the first two together. And that's nice because we know the volume of a cone and the volume of a cylinder. And so we know that these solids have the same heights. And at any height, if we add up these two, we get the same area as in the cross section of the third one. So how is that helpful? What can we do with Cavalier's principle? We know that those volumes are the same. So if we add up the volumes of the hemisphere and the cone, we get the volume of the cylinder. So let's do the work here. So what's the volume of the cone here? That's going to be one third pi times the radius cubed, because the height is also the same as the radius in this case by how we constructed it. And what's the volume of the cylinder? It's going to be pi times the radius cubed. And so we plug these into what we know from Cavalier's principle. And to solve this, we subtract this quantity from both sides. And we get 2 thirds pi r cubed. So that's the volume of the hemisphere. So how can we use that to figure out the volume of an entire sphere? We would just double it. So it would be 4 thirds pi r cubed is the volume of the sphere. So using this formula, I'd like you to calculate the volume of a sphere with this diameter. So try that, and I'll show you my solution. So the diameter is 12 centimeters, so that means that the radius is 6 centimeters. So we plug into our formula, and it wants us to calculate this to one decimal place. And we get about 904.8 cubic centimeters. So another important calculation is the surface area of a sphere. And to do that, we're going to break up the surface into a bunch of smaller regions. And we're going to connect those regions to the center of the sphere so that we have solids that are very similar to a cone. Now, the thing is, they're not actually cones because the bases aren't truly flat. They're parts of the sphere, which is round. But they're pretty close to a true cone. So the volume of each cone is about one-third times that region times r of the radius, which would be the height. And the volume of the sphere is going to be what we get if we add up all those cones together. So we know the formula for the volume of a sphere. That's going to be equal to 1 third times the sum of all those areas times r. Right? We just factor out the 1 third and the r from the sum because we have that in common. Now, if we let s equal the sum of all these areas, that's going to be the surface area of the sphere. So we can rewrite this last equation with this approximation. So we don't use an equal sign because, like we said, we're, we're approximating that we have cones. We don't truly really have cones. But the smaller and smaller we make the regions, we get closer to, the, to actual cones. They get flatter and flatter the smaller you, smaller you make them. So as the number of, re, of regions that we make approaches infinity, these two quantities become equal. So just, we can say they're equal now and solve for s because now we have a truly flat cone, uh, truly flat cones, and we get 4 pi r squared. So the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So try to calculate the surface area of the sphere to the nearest hundredth, and then I'll show you my solution. So here's our formula. We substitute, and we get 256 pi. So we plug that in the calculator and round to the nearest hundredth, and we get 804.25 square inches. In this lesson, we learned about Cavallari's principle, and we learned how to derive and apply the different formulas for area. Thank you for watching this video.